Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julio Ramirez, and it is a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Randy Poston. He is principal uh, at Pivot Engineers, a structural engineering consulting firm in Austin, Texas. Um, he's a, an authority in the field of reinforced concrete. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a current president, at least for a few more weeks, of the American Concrete Institute uh, at the next convention in Chicago here this spring. He's going to hand the baton to uh, the next president, but he will remain as member of the past president committee for another. How long do they uh, do that? About four more years. Four more years. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> in the American Concrete Institute once you become president. He's also past chair of the American Concrete Institute ACI Committee 318 Building Code requirements and uh, has received the Henry L. Kennedy Award uh, for his work as well as many other recognitions in, uh, during his very illustrious career. Uh, today Randy is going to talk about the business of engineering. Uh, he also has a seminar tomorrow at 4.30 here <coughs> which would be more on the uh, structural engineering side of, of uh, his expertise. But today he's going to talk to us about um, what, uh, what is the basic information required to run an engineering company. And uh, I'm very interested in hearing that. He's got many years of experience and we look forward to your presentation. Well, All right, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramirez, and uh, it's glad to, I'm glad to be back here in uh, West Lafayette, Purdue University. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about how this uh, started with this lecture. I, uh, I had, was asked by the, uh, essentially the chair at the University of Texas at Austin. They teach a class uh, that's required of every senior to take that's on uh, ba basically professionalism and ethics and it's a one hour course but every senior is required to take it um, and as part of that he said you know it'd be good if we had a uh, a lecture just to somewhat to be able to tell people you know if they are interested in consulting engineering or running their own business how you might do that so that's how it started it's probably about 10 years ago that I started doing it and I do it every every uh, semester uh, twice a year and it's kind of evolved over over time. And one of the things uh, we've got a small group here, and uh, I I have some prepared remarks, but at the end I really want to open it up to, to questions. That's really the way it works. Uh, great, I usually have it, and then get I get I get questions all over the board. So I'm happy to answer anything that you may have. So uh, just a little bit about you know uh, our business, uh, Pivot Engineers. We're located in uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, we've had projects uh, mostly around the, uh, the the country and in a few foreign uh, countries as 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 well. Uh, we are uh, uh, kind of a specialty consulting structural engineering firm where uh, a lot of times uh, the terminology is forensic structural engineering. We look at uh, failures. We look at uh, problem stru structures that are having uh, service performance problems in, uh, uh, in, in their uh, function, uh, durability performance problems, and then also we do a lot in the strengthening and r repair and design of uh, infrastructure. I've been involved in a lot of different failures over uh, the years. This is one at the uh, uh, Lowe's Motor Speedway in which there are 100 people on a, a pretension, precast uh, pedestrian bridge over a highway, uh, ended up having uh, an issue with uh, corrosion of the strands by an additive that was added to uh, this mortar right here uh, it was full of chlorides and of course uh, uh, chlorides and corrosion go go together. Uh, been involved with some big bridges uh, the uh, um, cable stay bridges and in, in uh, Texas had there were two there's two in the inventory uh, they're now building a third one. Uh, they had an issue with, uh, and it's very common in, in Texas, this, uh, this is in Beaumont, Texas, this is uh, the one you saw uh, uh, just a minute ago, and then the one you'll see here in, on, the, on the left with some of the vibration uh, uh, issues here. 
Uh, it's just a little bit of rain and wind and uh, with that it, it creates an aerodynamic instability, it, it fractured all the guide plates. And so, you know, bottom line is we get involved in some, you know, uh, very unique sort of uh, circumstances. I, 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 I can tell you I was not a, an expert in aerodynamics or an expert in vibration, but uh, uh, there weren't a whole lot of people that were, so we got in, uh, got our feet wet, and uh, you can see how much uh, vibration that's occurring. And the, of course the issue with that moving back and forth is uh, fatigue, an issue with fatigue of the uh, uh, been involved with a lot of infrastructure projects. This is a project in uh, Marina del Rey. Uh, it's a seawall project. Uh, they started having, uh, it was built in the late 50s and early 60s by the Corps of Engineers. They started having failures uh, of these very simple cantilever walls. Uh, and it was due to an issue at the joint between the, essentially the footing uh, and the uh, wall. Uh, with tidal fluctuations in a marine environment, of course, you get chlorides and uh, oxygen introduced as the tides go down uh, and uh, corrosion of the reinforcing steel. So that was really what was causing those collapses. We were able to come up with some NDT technology where we could uh, look at the back side of the wall and see if there were, in fact, delaminations. Uh, using a uh, uh, what's called impact echo, a stress wave technique, and uh, ultimately what we did was to uh, put these what we call strong backs on the back side of the wall and just tied the wall uh, to the strong back. So even though it was a vertical member, you usu usually think of something like caissons holding gra uh, primarily gravity loads. In this case, it was just a, uh, a flexural members, and we had upgraded for seismic as well. It was not designed originally for uh, uh, seismically and so we had to upgrade it for seismic along with uh, if there was corrosion damage we would have to increase the number of caissons per uh, per wall. So we uh, did this testing, went in uh, with the program and did the repair. So just want to kind of give you an idea about our, our firm and kind of my background and then talk to you a little bit about you know running an engineering business and and what I had to learn along the way because I really wasn't trained as a business person and uh, what kinds of things you need to think about. Uh, so let's talk about career paths, some of the professional and financial basics, some salary and pay, uh, how we set those, and, and a little bit even about business value. How do you value a consulting uh, engineering firm? Uh, this is a big uh, chart with different career paths. Uh, I've kind of been associated with each track depending. I've had a number of different lives in my uh, my uh, career. I worked for uh, uh, Exxon Production Research Company at one time. I entered in as a, uh, a research engineer and in business typically you get to a point where you're probably either going to be asked to be technical or business oriented. Uh, side of business. A uh, place like Exxon they really have two uh, dual track uh, which is uh, nice and uh, you know that's always not necessarily always the case but uh, you can go in as an engineer you know end up as president and CEO and I always like to tell the story of, of the person who was the uh, 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 that really rose the uh, uh, ranks at, uh, uh, at, at Exxon and uh, became the president and CEO was a civil engineer uh, from uh, graduated from the University of Texas. He had one, uh, one degree and uh, rose to be the CEO and was most recently the uh, Secretary of State of the United States, so Rex Tillerson. So, uh, you know, kind of a well-known story. Uh, so you can, in fact, uh, rise in a, in a corporate ladder. Uh, consulting engineering firms, so you t typically don't have uh, as an elaborate uh, uh, of a structure uh, because of uh, you know the nature of the business being being smaller. Uh, and a, a consulting firm like ours, uh, over on the right hand side, you can kind of see the levels we have. You start off as a graduate engineer and go through uh, uh, to a senior engineer through associate and principal and uh, I, I am the senior principal uh, of this firm. So not as much uh, hierarchy as you will as you might have in a larger engineering firm or in a large corporation that has a major component that's engineering. Uh, a little bit about 
my career, just to, again to establish some of the, you know, I've, I've had a number of different things that I've done. I worked one summer uh, after I graduated uh, designing bridges in San Antonio, Texas uh, for the Texas Department of Transportation. I went ahead and, you know, I completed my master's and I went to work at Exxon, as I mentioned, for a couple years and then I went back to school to get my PhD thinking I'd go back to Exxon, but at that time when I was uh, uh, finishing up the oil, I had a good offer to go back, but I was a little concerned about what the industry may be doing over the next, uh, my lifetime, you know, next 30 years. So I ended up taking a position a as a faculty member at Auburn University and uh, uh, did that for about uh, two years. And it, uh, uh, you know, wasn't uh, the right fit for me and I had, a, had to have a job. So I ended up taking a, a job with a small consulting firm up uh, out in Connecticut, outside New York City, and I uh, kind of learned uh, the ropes about business and engineering uh, from these uh, older uh, men that are working for at the time. I left there after about seven years and went to work for a large uh, engineering firm called KCI Technologies. They were based in Baltimore, Maryland, but I was working at a, a branch office in Northern uh, uh, Virginia. And after about two and a half years, uh, two other folks at that KCI Technologies in that branch, we decided we were going to go across the street and open up a business and um, uh, of our own. And at the last minute, the president of KCI Technologies came to us and said, how would you like to buy out the division, this small little division in Virginia? And we said, okay. Uh, I can tell you at the time I didn't have any money. Uh, my partners probably didn't have a whole lot of money. We all had families. Uh, they ended up being our banker. We, uh, uh, we did not have to go out and formally get a bank loan, so we ended up paying them off uh, in about uh, two and a half years. Uh, for the loan that we had for buying out this uh, buying out this business, and uh, we ended up taking out a loan after that to keep us going, but and we paid that off in about two years. So we uh, through uh, I was with that firm for a little over 20 years. Uh, we grew to about 60 employees, and then in uh, uh, 2015, I separated from that firm, took all the people in Austin, the folks working with me, all the work, and we uh, split off and formed. Uh, uh, pivot engineers and we're now, I think we had six or seven people at the time, we're up to uh, 14 employees. And the reason I like to bring, uh, show this is because I uh, read in a, uh, a trade magazine uh, fairly, uh, probably within the last two years that uh, an engineer uh, today on average has probably seven employers during their career. Uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, a couple of folks in this room have only had probably one employer or two employers, but uh, uh, you know, the average engineer has seven, and I apparently have met average engineer because if you go back and look at how many positions I've had, it's, it's, it's exactly seven. So it, it, uh, part of the message is you don't have to think wherever you go your first job is the only job you're ever going to have. Uh, in your uh, in your career, and um, one thing uh, too, I like to uh, emphasize is that uh, you know, with a, a civil engineering background in particular, but any engineering background, you're really well equipped to uh, handle problems. I I've had a number of colleagues over the years that got out of the real technical side of doing engineering work. They work, started to work for man management consulting firms, uh, kind of business operations and so forth. They've been uh, quite successful. So you really get uh, really what you learn in engineering is to solve problems. So uh, a couple things I want to talk about when you're uh, setting up a company, about uh, protecting yourself, uh, talk about liability and licensure, talk a little bit about how pay and benefits work, setting hourly rates and fees, uh, how we keep the doors open and uh, in, in cash flow. So first, company type. Uh, I know very few, uh, I, I still know one person who is a sole proprietor. He, he works as an engineer, he's not, he doesn't have a company. Uh, he certainly can, uh, can, can do that, but I think it runs risk in terms of uh, 
uh, if you ever have a, a claim against you. So typically, uh, we set up either as a limited liability partnership. Uh, uh, Pivot happens to be a limited liability uh, corporation, actually a professional limited liability corporation. Uh, and then otherwise you could have an Inc, which is the traditional uh, C corporation, which m most corporations are. Uh, in my previous firm, that's what we were, or, uh, you know, again, a limited liability corporation. There's some, uh, each of these you find out, uh, you know, Uncle Sam's going to figure out how to get your money. It doesn't matter. There are some, you know, uh, trade-offs. You may get a little bit more money uh, uh, when you're a, an LLC, but then you uh, end up having to pay for it later. So there's always uh, uh, some immediate gains, but eventually Uncle Sam's going to figure out how to tax you and, and tax the corporation. Uh, <coughs> C corporations typically have what's called double taxation. They 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 pay. Uh, you know they, they they pay on there uh, as they go along and they pay uh, at the at the end of the year too so uh, typically C corporations if in, and I know a number of engineering firms that do this at the end of the year they wipe out all their their money in the bank account they completely get and then they they go go out and get a loan they start uh, you know billing for their uh, work until they have enough money and they pay off that loan and then they go to the end of the year and then they get rid of it so that they don't have to pay uh, uh, income tax f as a corporation at the end of the year. Uh, S corporations uh, was what my previous firm uh, was but it, it's limited to about a hundred owners so it typically if you have a larger firm it may not be appropriate uh, uh, for that. There are some small tax advantages uh, when you sell that business uh, that you don't have with other forms of corporations like a C corporation. Uh, professional liability insurance, I, you know, I, uh, we all have, uh, knock on wood, uh, uh, I've never in any of the companies I've been involved with had a claim. Uh, it's also called errors and omissions insurance and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's to protect you against negligence. I mean, uh, we all make mistakes. I mean, of course, all of you do perfect on your homeworks and do perfect on your exam, so you never make a mistake. I'm, of course, kidding. We all make mistakes. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't mean a lot of consequence, but, you know, uh, we're not guaranteeing our work. We're not providing a warranty to our work. It's just that we're the standard of care. We're, what we're saying is we're meeting the standard of a care of an engineer working in that same geographical region. So like in Austin, Texas, it's a standard in, in Austin. Uh, it's a little bit hard to define what that is, but would another engineer be practicing at the same level uh, there? In, in other geographical re, uh, regions, it might have a little bit different uh, inf inference, particularly like out on the West Coast. What standard out there may not be the standard of practice uh, in other geographical uh, re, uh, areas. So it's the standard of care. If you've met the standard of care, then insurance-wise and, and legally uh, uh, you would be protected. So no design is perfect and we want to indemnify ourselves against these uh, negligent acts uh, if we uh, happen to have one. Uh, <coughs> licensure is uh, one thing that I I feel strongly about. I think it's you know it's required in all states to be practice engineering. Uh, uh, you have to be licensed in that state, uh, uh, what, wherever you're practicing. Uh, generally, firms also may need to be registered. Uh, that tends to be more of just them being able to tax a business. It's, a, it's almost like a business tax, but we uh, often have to get licensed as uh, pivot engineers in the states that we work in. Fortunately, uh, there's ways of getting reciprocity. Once you're licensed, uh, you can get reciprocity in other states with your uh, professional uh, license. Uh, you know, EIT is something that uh, everyone should be taking as an undergraduate, getting it over with. Uh, the PE uh, is typically done after four years of experience. Uh, Texas has recently allowed you to go uh, take that exam as soon as you've passed the EIT, so you can in fact uh, take it as soon as you've passed your EIT, even though you don't have your four years of experience. Uh, there's some other uh, licensing that uh, is required for other disciplines, such as structural engineering. Uh, it requires generally additional four years of experience, and uh, you have to take 16 hours of examination. Uh, there is a national registry called NCEES uh, that you can uh, 
basically apply to and it keeps all of your records so whenever you need to go get licensed in another state instead of refilling out these forms uh, going and asking uh, your uh, mentors can you please write another uh, reference letter for me it's all kept in one neat place and all you need to do is send it off so it makes it a lot easier now in order to get licensed in other other places yes Questions. Yes, of course, yeah. With regards to the previous one, you showed a map where you show the states where you yep. practice. Yeah, right? yeah. Yep. And then you say, and fortunately, other states offer reciprocity. Right. Which means you don't need to do anything special yep. um, to register. But so, how do you decide where you register? Is where you have work, but then work may come up somewhere else. Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's tough. Typically, we don't get licensed in the state, and I think that had. If you looked at the map, it was probably like 37 states. I happen to be licensed in about 26 or 27. Some other folks in our office are probably in other states, but you know those states were like Idaho, I've never done any work in. I don't get licensed there. If I potentially get a job there or get a job there, I immediately go and get licensed by reciprocity in that state. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, it's just a requirement. Whenever you're doing engineering work, some uh, some jurisdictions, it's pretty clear. They they say only if you're designing something where you're signing and sealing a design or, or, or construction documents, you must get licensed. A lot of our work is consulting work where we're just looking at a you know an issue or problem. We may not need to get licensed, but most of them, m most states actually consider that to be engineering these days. So it's a it's a trade-off. Yes, Vince. You mentioned uh, Texas allowing you to take the PCAT yeah. <clears throat> right after the FE exam. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, th I don't think it's a good idea, and I got I got a trapped in in that in Indiana. Uh, I I did it back in the day. They used to allow that. I you know took the exam when I was a senior, passed it, and then when I had to get licensed here at the time, they would not accept it unless you had already had four years experience. I had to go back and take the exam again. Ooh, when I was that. yeah, when I was 50 years old, so yeah. you know it was a little it was a little more. Uh, you know, the good thing is I it allowed me because I took another uh, an SE exam. It allowed me to get licensed as an SE in state. So uh, you know, I it wasn't a pleasant experience, but uh, I I think it really should be after four years of experience. Okay. Yeah, there are 14 states that do allow that. Oh, I didn't know it was that many. So yeah, yeah. And, and they call it uncoupling. Uncoupling, of the, of yeah. The education, yeah. Uh, the exams and the experience record. Yeah, I, I, I'm, just, I'm not sure it's a good idea. I sit yeah. on the board in Indiana. Oh, do you? Okay, so, yeah. Um, I'm not sure it's a good idea either. Yeah, way. yeah. It's uh, and Texas had gotten rid of it, and then they just reinstituted it probably two or three years ago. It's been very, very recent. So, uh, so uh, let me talk a little bit of how we set hourly rates because you know basically what we're selling we're not selling products or widgets we're selling time we're selling our services and our uh, we uh, you know let, let's just go through some numbers if a starting salary in our office for a master's uh, might be something on order of, you know seventy thousand dollars plus uh, that's about thirty three dollars and sixty five cents an hour uh, we got to pay, be competitive. We got to pay health benefits. We got to pay towards their 401k retirement, uh, vacation time, rent, phone taxes, elect, you know, you name it. You got to pay for it. Well, that all costs money. Uh, typically, it's about one and at least one and a half times the salary. So, in other words, you got to make one. You're paying them, and then one and a half times their salary to take care of all the office space and all that goes into paying that individual makes it two and a half. Uh, I'm going to show this profit and I say that's pretty high and it is high for an engineering business but we're we're a, a, a very specialized uh, uh, firm. Uh, if you do very kind of normal I'd say design work uh, that uh, I, I would say that number is probably more like a 20 percent, 25 percent. Uh, because we're a specialty firm and we're really selling our expertise, we can typically be a little bit higher than that in our profit. So 50 percent of two and a half is 1.25. Uh, that makes our total multiplier for setting hourly rates is two and a half plus 1.25 is 3.75. And if you're making 33.65 and you multiply that by 3.75, that gives you an hourly rate that's about $130 an hour. So I think a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a little mind-boggling for me. I know when I was first getting out, I was like, 
you know, whatever I was making, you know, how could anybody charge, you know, twice or three times what I was making? You know, I, I don't know anything, but in reality, you, you do know a lot. Uh, so this would be, if you look at our fee schedule, uh, for a graduate engineer, uh, we would charge them off at uh, $130 uh, an, an hour, which I, admittedly, I'm going to say, is, is high for a lot of, lot of firms. I've, I, I have friends that are and colleagues that are in design firms, and they're, kind of their processes are a little different than charging hourly rates like we do, but uh, it, when you see their hourly rates, they tend to be lower, but uh, they're making up on volume of, of work, uh, whereas we're selling uh, directly our time. And, uh, is that regardless of the type of work? So, for instance, if you are, because I know yeah. that you sometimes end up in court, yeah. right? and you're, you have to test the Yeah, yeah. So that's a different that's a different schedule. So this is uh, consulting work, basically. <coughs> any, <coughs> excuse me, any expert work. Uh, when you're actually testifying, given depositions, anything related to that is typically one and a half times this number. So it's a 50% premium whenever you're doing uh, legal legal work. That's what we say. It's very. Uh, it can be a very stressful situation. So that's you know it's worth the, and they're paying for your real expertise. Uh, so uh, charge a building. Not every hour you spend 2,080 hours a, a year, 52 weeks. You got vacation time. You got sick time. Uh, one thing that we're uh, we feel very strongly about is attendance to conferences. All our folks, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, they absolutely don't want to, but they all do. We uh, let them join associations. We want them to become members of technical committees and, and be producing. And it's, it costs money to do that, to attend conferences. Uh, you got other things that you need them to do during the, uh, during the week, uh, some administrative duties. You know, a lot of it depends on our workload. We'll have a lot of work and then it'll, it may decline, uh, so forth. So we t typically uh, target for professional engineering staff about a 70% chargeability rate. Uh, more senior engineers would be 60%, principals would be 50%, uh, that would be myself and uh, so you know my chargeability is going down as your career advances and a lot of that is because not only am I trying to do work, I'm also trying to get work and so when you're trying to get work you can't charge for your time uh, so naturally your chargeability goes down. Uh, there, our administrative staff typically is 25% and of course any accounting you do, uh, marketing, we don't have a marketing person but uh, you wouldn't be able to charge for them anyway. That's just the part of doing business. So on, on if you looked at kind of a, a weighted average cumulatively when at the end of the month I can look at very quickly and see what our overall chargeability for our staff is and uh, like last uh, you know, December we were probably at 60 percent, 61 percent is a little lower. We're still fine, we're not doing, but you know, if you're doing 65 percent, you're, you're definitely making money. If you're doing 70 percent, you're killing it. So it's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's variable to that, those kinds of percentages. So I can look at the end of the month and know very quickly, are we, are we okay, are we doing good, are we doing fantastic? And so it's a good way to uh, uh, look at it. So uh, again, so we, we look at that very uh, r religiously, it doesn't take a lot of time at the end of the month to see what our monthly chargeability is. So if you looked at a pie chart, this was a snapshot probably from six or seven years ago. Uh, it's a little bit outdated. Our profit that year after you, uh, all things considered, was a, a fair bit lower than our target of 50%. It was only 20%. Uh, you know, but we're, again, we're paying for time, uh, people's time and their intellect. Uh, that's where the money, most of the money goes in a consulting firm. It's, you know, f uh, fully 50% of what is going just to pay people. The rest of it is to pay for everything else in the office and pay for, uh, you know, taxes and overhead and, and those sort of things. But salary and benefits is the, uh, by far the biggest uh, uh, cost item in a engineering firm. So just let's, I'm going to just kind of go through uh, what a typical payroll period might look like for pivot engineers. Uh, our overhead is uh, uh, our payroll might be, uh, say, uh, $100,000 in a month. Our overhead's about uh, uh, $70,000. So our total obligations in a month are about $170,000. And for a typical month, we might have a, our fees or our, what we're able to charge 
is around 220,000. So that looks pretty good. We're making, say, $50,000 a month. Okay? Well, that's great as long as your client's paying you within the first month, right? If they pay you, so like you got to keep your checkbook, right? You got to know what money's coming in, what money's going out. It's great. We'd be, you know, if we did this every month, pay our bills, we'd be doing great. But unfortunately, uh, in business, not everybody is that good at, at, uh, at paying the bills. Uh, we actually are pretty fortunate. I think our average, uh, what we call AR days, which is account receivable days, is somewhere around 44 days, 45 days. Not, you know, so we have some that pay in 15 days and then we have some that don't pay for 100 days. And so on average we get paid in about 40, 45 days. So if the second month just go to the work, if you get, didn't get paid anything, you're going to have 50 you, you, if you were up 50k, suddenly you're going to be you have another hundred and seventy thousand dollars in obligations. Suddenly you're going to be one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in the hole. That's only after you know two months. And then if you know all heck breaks out and no one pays you for two months, and you have another hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars minus one twenty minus one hundred and seventy. Now you're minus two hundred ninety thousand dollars in a hole. So you can see how it happens uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, I, know, I know folks that uh, probably in uh, academic uh, life see things no different. I'm sure the dean deals with this, the head de deals with this, about the, uh, you know, the, the negative effects that, of, of things add adding on the burden that you have in, in, in a company. So uh, you know, it's for, cash flow is very important. That's something that we have to manage very closely. Uh, you know, uh, after 45 days, I'm looking at who owes us money, and uh, you know. So, although I'm uh, a senior principal in the firm and te very technical, I'm getting on the phone, calling our client, going, "Where's our money?" You know, it's what you have to do. Uh, I'm gonna just. I'm, I don't have any. Uh, I'm not trying to hide anything from you. I show this is some of what my compensation might look like on a given year. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, my hourly rate's $475 an hour. That's very high, but uh, you know, with the expertise that I've gained and the uh, uh, experience that I have, I'm able to justify uh, that. I use a higher multiplier instead of like three and a half. I, I trim, trim mine down some so I don't take a lot of pay on an every two week or, or bi-monthly basis. So, you know, my kind of normal just pay is $220,000. Uh, is just my base, kind of my base uh, uh, salary. Uh, in a given year, I showed you if we we're doing well, we may have fifty thousand dollars a month in 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 profits. Uh, what I've done with my younger partners is uh, base base it on both ownership and based on performance. Uh, for the first five years, we we rate each other, and we've rated ourselves pretty much uh, the same. You know, my partners are doing doing a competent job for their experience level. They think I'm doing a competent job for my experience level. So we split half of it by three ways. So we split three hundred thousand dollars of that uh, bonus structure three ways. That's a hundred thousand uh, dollars that might be coming to me. And then because I uh, had been a sixty percent owner. 60% of the other 300,000 would give uh, give another 180,000. So, my overall compensation uh, based on this model would be about $500,000. Uh, just to give you a look at how my pay has varied over time, people, I got, I started getting a lot of talk, you know, questions about, you know, where did you start out with? Where I started here, 1978. I made $900 a month working for TechStot designing bridges and then you know I went to graduate school and you don't get paid much in graduate school and then I worked at Exxon then I went back to graduate school and then I worked uh, uh, you know at Auburn for a couple of years then went with my first consulting firm and you know pretty low and it kind of gradually uh, gradually rose and then uh, when I went to this firm in Northern Virginia I, I took a little bit of a drop and we eventually uh, started our own business and you know it took a couple of years to get out from debt and you could see it started to take off and then um, I moved uh, in that firm I moved to a I opened a branch office in Austin uh, you know we did very well and you can see the 
my income rising, 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 and then for the last couple years, and one of the reasons that uh, I separated from my previous firm is I, I was doing a substantial amount of work and for what I was doing not being uh, fairly compensated uh, for it. You can see the drop, uh, drop in my, uh, uh, my income. I formed pivots, spun everything off. Uh, we got, uh, you know, we run a very lean shop, and you can see that uh, my income for the last uh, three or four years is uh, taken off uh, again. It all depends on whether you have enough job or not. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big part. It's a huge part. Yeah. We've been, we've been lucky or fortunate, however you want to say it, in terms of, but yes, yeah, that's the one thing uh, I'll say is that there's a cautionary tale on this, is uh, when we aren't doing well and I still have to pay all the employees, it's coming from my pocket, right? I'm going to have to put money into the company, uh, and in fact, when we first started Pivot, I didn't take any salary for six months. I just said, I'm not going to take any until we got it going and once we got it going then I felt more comfortable about it. So you as an owner of a company principal you got to do what you have to do in order to keep the, the business grounded. Uh, what is an engineering firm worth? Uh, you know that's a great question and you'll get whoever you ask you'll get a different answer from everybody. Uh, having kind of gone through uh, leaving firms and being bought out of firms, I can kind of give you some rules of thumb of how it works. And a lot of it depends on uh, what you find there's been in the last, uh, you know, five years particularly, uh, ten years, there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry. A lot of bigger firms buying smaller firms and they're generally buying smaller firms in, in target areas where they don't have, currently have business. Uh, they see an opportunity with maybe a smaller firm that has business there. They go in and buy out that firm and be, uh, begin building their business using their business model by buying out that smaller firm. And so we've seen a lot of that. Uh, and we've got some mega firms out there. We've got AECOM that has 160,000 employees or 150,000, whatever the number is. So some real big mega firms. So it depends on the size, and they're not always treated the same. Jacobs is a big public firm, 66,000. Uh, they've bought a lot of firms. Uh, Michael Baker, a uh, firm out of, uh, principally based in Pittsburgh, but they've, uh, uh, they also are a public uh, firm. Uh, Walter P. Moore is a private firm. This is a lar one of the larger, I'd say, structural, pure structural, well, they're both civil and structural engineering, but firm, it's a Texas firm based in Houston. Uh, operations, uh, they opened up in California, Florida, uh, even up uh, to the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, you know, it's only worth whatever the owners think they can get for it. And I know folks that work there, uh, they have some buy-in and buy-outs and, uh, you know, it's kept very secret, but, you know, so it's hard to know exactly what they think their business is worth. And here we got lonely uh, pivot engineers with 14 employees. What the heck is that worth? Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you what I think it's worth and, uh, you know, it's, and it's not a whole lot. A lot of it depends on you know, you got book value, you got cash that may be coming in, and it's goodwill. Uh, there's something called goodwill that IR, uh, the IRS recognizes is like, you know, does this firm have a good reputation and whether folks that are there that have been there are continuing on, is it able to translate that into actual uh, business? So w when it comes down to it, the, the rule, kind of the small firm, the rules of thumb that it might be something on the order of about 20% or 30% more than the book value. And the book value is nothing more than cash in the bank. You've got money, you've got uh, outstanding rec receivables, you know, money that you've invoiced that hadn't been paid yet. You've, you own some computers, you own some desks, you own some, uh, maybe some equipment, you may own a few vehicles or trucks, whatever. Not a whole lot. I mean, that stuff's not really not worth, worth much. So there, it's, it's, it's really only worth what's in the bank and what you can count on times a little bit. That's, that's kind of the rule of, uh, the rule of, uh, of thumb. Randy, yes. Question. So, <clears throat> it might be kind of personal, but you could have chosen to name the company Poster. Yes. Engineers. Yeah. So I'm looking, for instance, yeah. at the private company, someone like Walter P. Moore. Yeah. Walter P. Moore is not with us anymore. No. no. Uh, so 
the company is basically benefiting from a name yes. that is tied to a tradition, whatever it is, yeah. and maybe that's what you call goodwill. That's the goodwill. That's and exactly and right. That has a value. That what, what about the, your company? Because Poston has a, now, as you noted in the previous chart, yeah. a certain value. Yeah. Right? It does, and uh, we, we thought a lot about, uh, uh, about that. My previous company had, uh, of course, I was the P and W, we, we were Whitlock, Dalrymple, Poston, and we were doing, but we were doing business as WDP consulting engineers, okay? Uh, but as it turns out, for them, you know, they, they can't use my name, so they became legally WDP and Associates, and the person who was coming up, his last name happened to be Peterson. So he happened, it was fortuitous that there was another P coming up and he became another principal uh, in, the, in, the, in the firm. We talked about uh, having a name associated with, uh, uh, with Poston, but uh, I, and your argument is a, is, is a good one, and I, I actually kind of countered that with my two younger partners. I said, look, I'm going to be around for a while, I'm not going anywhere, but I think uh, you know, as we develop business and uh, uh, keep business and whatever, people are going to start knowing you more than they know me. I'm always going to be the face for, for a while, but I think it's important for us to have a different, different kind of name. And Pivot, pivot just kind of came, in, in my life at the time, I was pivoting from another, you know, that's how, and it started with a P. So P, post and pivot, that's, that's kind of how the name evolved. And yes, Vance? Engaged in any succession planning? We have. Okay. Yeah, we definitely have. That's very important. De de def for a small firm. De small firm, we have it all, all in place. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we definitely, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about how we, how we did that. It's a little bit different business model than my previous firm, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, so this is kind of, you know, business is only what is worth what people will pay for it is what it comes down to. Uh, oh, um, so uh, and just to show you what my previous firm, uh, we had a, I only, I put in $15,000 of my own money when we bought out this small, this operation from KCI Technologies. Uh, I didn't have any, if they asked for any more, I put down 15000 but the, the, they took out a, they were our banker. We basically, uh, they wanted $700,000 for the business. So uh, we, you know, 45000 towards a uh, uh, $700,000 debt, but we worked like crazy. We didn't, uh, they still had some rules again about what kind of pay we could have, but we got them paid off, uh, as I mentioned, in a, very quickly in about two and a half years. We then about half, and we, we paid them off because we went out and got another loan for about half the money. We could eventually get, a, you know, w one of the things you realize about business, and I, uh, and I got even got asked that, and pivot when we started to get a loan is like, you know, I've obviously been very successful with operations in Austin, but I went to the bank and it's like, well, you don't have any history. I go, yeah, I got plenty of history. Yeah, but it was with another firm. I go, but the other firm was, a lot of it was me. And it's like, well, that doesn't matter. So anyway, I, when I did pivot, I had enough resources and capital in order to put uh, money into it. Uh, back then, I, di I didn't, uh, but we paid off very quickly. Uh, our annual, you know, uh, with the goodwill, uh, you, uh, another couple rules of thumb are about something around one-time annual sales, whatever your revenue is in a year, multiply it by that one, that might be where, what the firm is with. Six to eight times annual profit uh, is another rule of thumb. On average, you know, we were doing, say, $5 million, and I was a third owner, that'd be $1.6 million in uh, between different stock, uh, stock sale, back in 2012 and then a spinoff uh, when I did the pivot business uh, I got uh, an additional stock sale uh, for about one and a half uh, a million total so that that was kind of what the value uh, you know a fifteen thousand dollar investment grew to about 1.5 million dollars over 20, 20 years so we did things a little differently. So I have one of my younger partners, uh, fortunately, was very good. He decided he got a, 
uh, undergraduate degree at Florida and a master's at, in, at Texas in uh, structural engineering. And then while he was working for me with the previous firm, he said, I want to go get an MBA. Okay, so we helped pay for an MBA. Uh, uh, he did an executive MBA uh, during the week, uh, did that. And so when we started Pivot, it was great because he really said, we're going to do something a little differently. You know, this is his training in, you know, business school. So we capitalized it with a pretty small amount of money. We just, day one, of course, we had six employees. We had a rent due the next month. We had obligations. So we put $200,000 uh, into, uh, uh, into the business. I put in $120,000. They each put in $40,000. Uh, and what I get out, that, that hard number of capital of $120,000, I'm going to get for uh, when with our succession planning in a couple more years I'll be out of they're gonna have they're gonna owe me 150 for that one the privilege of me giving them 120 so that's a just a small a small amount of money but where I'm really going to you know the money is coming from is uh, when I reduce my stock I went from 60 percent to 51 percent and then I'm gonna go to 33 percent and then I'm gonna go to zero percent this is a big jump so on those years when uh, I'm getting phasing out of the company they're increasing their shares and I'm decreasing my shares they're essentially going to pay me a per, uh, you know that percent of the profit that I'm selling for the year so uh, in addition to my normal pay uh, they're they're not going to take any distributions uh, you know at the end they're gonna have to whatever the profit is for the last year they're gonna have to pay me a third of that as part of my uh, uh, buyout plan. So it's a pretty simple plan. It's not, it's not uh, a, lot of, a lot of people make the mistake what we did in the previous company. You, do you want to tie it to valuations? You want to tie, you get these people in there that don't, don't really understand engineering business. They understand business, but you know how you value a company is, uh, can be very, uh, uh, very subjective to say the least. So uh, that's it. So I typically do do exactly what I do here. I talk for 40 or 45 minutes just to kind of throw out some ideas and concepts and, and things. And I, over, the, over time, I've kind of added things into the uh, presentation as I get questions. I got questioned about, well, how much money do you make? So I was like, well, I don't, you know, I'm, I, I don't really, it doesn't matter it, it, uh, to me. Uh, I'm happy to know, uh, let you know, to give you a feeling because I always wondered how, how business works and how you do it, so uh, I didn't. I, I don't feel intimidated by the question. Uh, a quick question. If we said uh, short percentage at each stock sale. Yes. What period? You know, how many years? Uh, it, it was. It's either two or three years, depending. So it started. So when I get to be sixty-five, that's the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it has been set. It's been set, and. I don't plan to go anywhere when I'm 65. If they plan to have me around, if not, I'll do something else, you know. So, but yeah. So we, we uh, you know, and I want them to be, uh, you know, they need to be able to take advantage of ownership and things like that. I've had, you know, I've had some success in my career and, um, you know, I don't want to give it away, but I, I also want to make it, make it uh, good for them as well. In yes, Vance, uh, yeah. process of going to work, from school to a, for a consulting firm, um, you're uh, probably very strong on having them have the fundamentals of engineering. Yes. Time. And then what kind of pressure or impetus do you have, give them incentive to take the PE and become PEs? And is there a level above which they can't go uh, unless they have a PE license in a firm? Yes. So uh, you're in our firm. It's it's pretty simple. You're at a graduate engineer until you pass your PE exam. So you can't even you're not even a staff engineer until you become licensed. So there's a huge incentive, and their incentive is that we pay for the exam. We pay for them to if they need to take any uh, courses for it. We pay for that, uh, and if they pass the exam, uh, they get a bonus for passing the exam. Plus we give them a pay increase. That's uh, you know, I want to say in the three to five thousand dollar range, just for that, you know, for passing the exam. So we we incentivize it greatly. It's it's a must, now, you know, in an engineering business. How do you uh, uh, compare, or what is the, the weight that you put on of being an SE versus a PE, or both um, PE first and then an SE? It, it, yeah, that's a good uh, good question. I I can't say that we have a. Uh, 
we do recognize if someone goes on and gets takes the SE exam and passes the exam again we pay that you know pay for them passing we typically give them an increment it's probably not as big as the the PE in terms of I think what what happens kind of naturally organically is that those that have gotten the SE and have taken the exam and gone through that tend to you know are on a different plane in terms of their progression of their experience and work and knowledge and so that's where the advantage really really comes in it's not a uh, so there's some modest amount uh, we don't put a huge I mean if you can it, it depends on the state you know a lot of you know I'm SE in a number of states but you don't have to be an SE in some states to even though you're an SE in that state so it just depends on but some states require an SE so it just depends yeah mm -hmm. We, we have a class <coughs> which is senior design, mm -hmm. C490. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know, Vincent, Marcel, what do you think? But would this be something, this kind of talk? That well, I think it would be very appropriate. Um, the, uh, I taught it for 10 years mm -hmm. here, and the uh, students in that are, as you imagine, and you see students fresh coming out, they're interested in design. Uh, and they're enamored with all the technologies associated sure. with design. And so they really don't think about this other aspect of it. Uh, in this very room, I was uh, early on in one of the classes, I said to the students, I said, tell me the name of your firm that you're going to have when you uh, eventually have something. And one student said, what? <laughs> Another student said, well, it's the name of this. And he had that all in his yeah. mind's eye. Yeah. And so this kind of thing could plant uh, seeds in people's minds that uh, they can see what is involved in getting into and, and going for uh, having your own firm. Yeah, I think, and, and one thing I, uh, one of the questions, and may have, one of you may have had the question, but I get, you know, typically get asked the question, well, when can I do this? You know, it's like, you know, it's kind of hard to say exactly, right? But I can, uh, <clears throat> you know, I look back on my experience, I can tell you when I went to my first consulting firm, I, I didn't know anything about business, you know, I didn't know how, I didn't know how to figure out how much, uh, figure out a proposal for a project, how much time it was going to take, multiplying the numbers. I mean, I just didn't have the experience doing that. And you, you know, you learn that on the on the job. It's not that hard, but you know, it takes some experience to, to do that. It takes. Uh, uh, the other thing that you're, it takes a while to do is is, is build a, a reputation, and that that's, you know, that's challenging. And for for me, I, I spent time going to conferences and being very heavily involved in technical committees and you know a lot of uh, you know I mentioned we don't have a marketing person um, but that's a it's not so obvious we do have a marketing department our marketing department is every one of our employees that goes to conventions and committees and is out there people you know people come up to me at ACI and say your firm must be like a 500 people. I've seen I've seen 10, ten of your people at this meeting. I go, no, it's all 10 people on the are all gone. I mean, and you can see it in our monthly revenue. It it drops like a you know to nothing in at the end of March and and the end of October because not only are we paying for them to go, we're not able to charge any of our time. So it's a double whammy those months. But it's are the best marketing budget we've ever done people you know get to know you you get to they get to know your expertise they get to and so that's really uh, and I'm not saying that we're I mean when you're in a large huge firm where you're going after these mega projects they they do things differently they you know they have a whole business development teams and you have to have that for larger firms but for us uh, you know we kind of developed a very niche market and we uh, uh, we uh, uh, our expertise is really comes from people knowing us from our work in the in the industry. Can you give us an example of one of a typical project that you people have on the, on the tables right now? Sure, uh, I can tell you a number. So we're looking at 240 miles of flood control channel wall. So not unlike the Marina del Rey uh, for Ventura County. Uh, so they Ventura County is one of the largest counties in California. Uh, most of the water comes from the mountains, travels down all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's 50, 60 years old now, and they started having these wall failures, some of them next to homes and whatever. And they, 
Uh, one is they, they're challenged by just the database management of this inventory. How do you, how do you keep track of all this stuff? And the, even if you can keep track of it, how do you know whether something needs to be repaired now in five years or in 20 years? And so we're helping them. It, we're not doing all that for the, the fee that we're doing, but it's a substantial fee. We're helping them prioritize and categorize what they need to do for this big uh, inventory. So it's not structural design. Is it? It's not structural design. It's a, it's a, it's a, a an evaluation and assessment and planning. And you know we're giving them some schematic repairs. If if uh, if you have this, this is the type of fix you're going to do, so forth and so on. But we're not signing and sealing 240 miles worth of repair drawings. That's correct. So, uh, we have. Uh, uh, we're involved in the uh, as an expert for the collapse of the Hard Rock Cafe uh, uh, Hotel, not and not Cafe Hotel in New Orleans. Uh, we're involved with some uh, problems with a fairly large bridge being built in in Washington D.C. that's had some concreting uh, uh, issues. Uh, uh, we've been helping a. Uh, there's a large LNG facility being built near Beaumont, Texas, and it's a pretty simple one, but kind of interesting. They're uh, they're u they're using something like 15,000 piles, and they're concerned about uh, the environment it's going in and what kind of service life they're going to expect out of their concrete mix. So a lot of it's service life prediction modeling and and so forth. Um, we have a, uh, a, a project up in Dallas, a bridge that not vibrations like the cable stays, but ha been having some vibrations of some other elements that have uh, created a uh, fatigue issue. Um, right, I'd say any given time, our firm, we probably have something on the order of about uh, 20 to 25 projects. Yeah, with uh, 14 people. Uh, um, and uh, you know, so it kind of comes and goes, and you never can, you never know where it's coming from. But, you know, f uh, thankfully we we keep getting keep getting calls. Uh, 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 you know, uh, the biggest thing you can do for getting work is doing good work. And uh, I I always tell people, you know, we're 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 smart. We're reasonably smart people at our firm. I've got some excellent excellent people, just a lot smarter than I am, and. Uh, uh, but the thing that people always, uh, when you ask clients, well, you know, what, what did you think about us? What are you doing? And a lot of times they're kind of bashful about, uh, about telling you. But the, the one thing that always struck with me back fairly early in my career, and I asked that question, and it was actually an, an, an assistant attorney general for the state of Virginia, Virginia, and she goes, oh, it's simple. You returned my phone call. <laughs> I was like, doesn't everybody do that? It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, so, you know, we're very, I, I mean, it sounds a little trite, but we're very uh, service oriented. I mean, we get calls and I, you know, there's a lot of times I'm going to get called and I'm going to probably get chewed out about something, but, you know, I make the call and, uh, you know, you have to, you have to do those sort of, sort of things. What does the role of BIM play in your firm? So BIM doesn't have a huge role in our firm. We've we've had uh, we've had a couple projects that uh, had some BIM related issues. Uh, it was the issue with the BIM, uh, uh, and some and it's actually a, a large large uh, NFL stadium being built uh, uh, in Las Vegas right now. And so it happens to be structural steel. We're typically known for kind of concrete activities, but uh, you know, some issues about how things were being put together and aligned and you know, where did BIM interface with that. So we, we had to look at a lot of different BIM and structural models to see how it was originally fitted and what was really happening in the field. So that was an interesting exercise uh, for us, even though we're not you know, BIM experts. So we're, we're not, we, we, de we do design repairs, I mean, uh, but they're not, uh, uh, it's not like you're, you know, producing 500 sheets of drawings for a huge, uh, huge, huge uh, infrastructure uh, project. Oh, the other project that's one of our bigger projects right now, I, uh, very, very neat, is in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and they, uh, 
there was an old uh, facility that was last used in 19, uh, 1971, but it was a it was an, uh, a meat packing meat uh, 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 factory, and uh, they had been used since the 30s, and they kept adding buildings and buildings and buildings, and then it had been used since 1971. You know, the roof's gone down, water's trickled in, it's deteriorating all heck, and. Uh, anyway, these uh, developers came in and saw it's up on this magnificent hill in Nashville overlooking the river. And um, he's like, and it's in an area that's being re gentrified, uh, going through gentrification uh, tremendously, and saw an opportunity and uh, got it for a song and a dance, but re rehabilitating this meatpacking facility into, into uh, condos and office building and whatever. But, and that wouldn't be our kind of a, you know, that's being done a lot, but a lot of the structures where that's being done are pretty sound. This one has massive, massive corrosion issues. I mean, and concrete and steel and, and so we're having to uh, make, you know, judgments of what's being, can be torn out, what can't be torn out, what can be re rehabilitated. It's a, it's a very big, <coughs> big project for us, but we're excited about it. Uh, what, uh as a prime contractor, or you want to go just south? Um, we're, we're, we're teamed up with uh, someone that uh, Professor Ramirez knows, uh, very, uh, have a very well-known design firm. They do a lot of new design. Uh, they were the ones who originally got team d uh, called out about it, but they knew they're not, they're not kind of deterioration and mechanics and repair, but uh, so they're involved. So we're kind of e equal in the in the team. There's a number of things that they're they're working on that uh, that we don't do that they can do and and what. So, but typically uh, uh, that that one we're teamed up on. Um, you know, some of these other ones generally we're the prime. Um, a, a lot of projects we're the we're the we're the prime. You, see, you know, we end up asking questions. So meant for these people. That's right. That's right. That's what, that's what I was saying. So. <laughs> Oh, one, and one thing I was going to say about, it didn't quite finish my thought about when, when is the appropriate time, you know, I kind of lost track of that, uh, of, of that. And I, you know, I, I thought about it because I got to ask that question. I thought a lot about it in the context of my career and, and uh, what I finally came up with, one is it took me, you know, because I went to graduate school, it took me a few extra years to get my license. So uh, it, from the period that I got my license to I felt comfortable that uh, you know, with being in consulting firms and understanding the business, thinking I knew enough people that would want to hire me uh, for to do a right. It was about ten years, so it's from my mid thirties. That was my question. That was your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so in your yes. Then you finish your PhD. Yeah. Then you work yeah. Yeah. A number of years until we uh, until we split off ourselves. So it was about, you know, I was thirty six. Thirty six ish uh, something in that neighborhood where uh, you know I, I think that I had the guts to go out on my own and do it but it's not you know a lot of people think oh it's not engineering consulting you're selling this it, you, look you all have great engineering backgrounds and experience all you know all of us get out you get out of Purdue you're gonna you're gonna have the uh, the, the tools to be a great engineer technically to be in business, it's hard to just say, slap a shingle up and say, I'm in business. Because uh, business, uh, you really, uh, you have to have a track record. And that's not, that's not different than I think in almost any business. I mean, short of maybe, uh, you know, I get a little uh, 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 kind of troubled sometimes when I hear about, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, tech companies and the amount of money they're spending with uh, uh, dollars that are coming in with, uh, you know, it's like, what are you spending this money on? I couldn't spend that much money in my life, but, you know, there's so much money flowing into some of these technology uh, uh, companies, and some of them are quite successful and others, others aren't. But, you know, for selling your services, selling your technical expertise, it just, it, 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 it takes a while for you to get comfortable, for you to uh, feel comfortable, so don't, but don't feel bad about that. I mean, everybody goes through it. I don't know of anybody that got out of school and started their own firm that's been successful. I, I, I don't know. They're, they're, it probably exists, but I don't know of any. There's a question that's asked faculty all the time. Yeah. Should I get a master's in my technical field or a master's MBA as far as my career? You've been yeah, I, technical, but 
but yeah. you've seen people with the MBAs such as... Yeah, my, my uh, younger partner. I personally think in a, a technical uh, master's is much, much better. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, in our firm, everybody is a master's or a PhD. It's about equally sp split. I mean, we have a pretty high level uh, staff. Um, and uh, uh, I think just to operate as kind of this, you know, we, you know, it, it was some by design. It wasn't just happenstance that, you know, to kind of build around this, uh, this idea of having kind of a niche structural engineering firm. We're not the only one that are doing it. There are a lot of people in that, in that business, but you know, we're able to get higher fees. Our hourly rates are higher, uh, but you've got to be trained to do that. You've got to have people that n come in day one and can start producing. And so a master's, I think, in a specialty area is, 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 is a must. You know, the, the uh, MBA, not to take away from my uh, younger partner, has been great because he had he had some really clever ideas about you know how we're doing our accounting systems, how we're doing. I mean, everything we do now is on our our phone. We don't have our own accounting system. It's all being done in San Francisco on the cloud, and you know it's all this stuff. So it's great, great to have an introduction of that that technology. That's why I say we're lean. We don't spend a lot of money on accounting systems on. These other systems are, it's uh, very, very, so our overhead ex is extremely uh, low. And, uh, you know, so if you have low overhead, any extra dollar can go to the partners. And we, we give, uh, the other thing we, we do, we give very generous bonuses twice a year to the staff. Uh, you know, they're typically between the uh, bonus in the middle of summer to the bonus at the end of the uh, uh, end of the year uh, can be anywhere depending on the individual whatever I'd say is at least 10 percent but maybe 25 or 30 percent of their salary that they're getting as a bonus so uh, you know we we have good people but we 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 have to pay people well to keep them so just part of the part of the part of the business thank you yeah you're welcome thank, thank you. you yeah you're welcome <laughs>